On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburg Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. Story, presented by Austin Film Festival, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers and directors. This week's On Story, a conversation with 12 Years a Slave and Three Kings screenwriter John Ridley. It's not about trying to dictate the individuals, here's how you should feel and here's how you should think and here's my big idea about um, the past. It's about can you feel something? Can you put yourself in a place? And these films that you see about so many different subject matters, whether they're of great imports or whether they're um, small, delicate pieces that just move you, that you forget that you're in your room watching TV, you forget you're in a theater, you forget the people around you and you just, whatever, your gut clinches, your heart opens or the tears flow, that's what we're here to do. This episode, John Ridley discusses his early career, adapting historical events, and the life-changing effect of writing 12 Years a Slave. When I was growing up, I, I did not like to read. I was very blessed. I had parents who uh, could not just afford me a decent education, but insisted upon uh, being educated and being well-read. But when your parents insist on things like that, you generally run in the other direction. And it wasn't honestly until high school that I I, I picked up a book and I just, I said, I'm going to start reading. And the first book I read was Hounds of the Baskerville. It was deep, it was rich, it was compelling. It was just one of those things that, that you know, you hear about it, you're supposed to read it. Sherlock Holmes, I was always interested in, in mysteries and thrillers to a degree. And read it and it's just the nuance and the detail and those things really um, compelled me. It wasn't, it wasn't writing that forced you at a distance. It was writing that even though it was elevated, it really invited you in. Absolutely. And so I started going to bookstores, and I remember the, the big thing for me, I was going to bookstores and I was trying to, what do I read, what do I read? And I pulled out, a, it was a paperback copy, and it was a paperback copy of Farewell, My Lovely, Raymond Chandler. And somebody had written a blurb on the back that just had said, Raymond Chandler writes like an angel slumming. <laughs> And I just read the blurb and I said, well, I, I need to find out what an angel slumming writes like. <laughs> and that, honestly, for me, was like the first hit on the crack pipe. It was just, um, it, it was a very muscular type of writing, but sensitive. It was like a sensitive thug writing. And the way he talked about uh, the city of Los Angeles, the way he talked about relationships, the way he talked about, I mean, very, you know, particularly when you're high school, you know, very kind of macho, machoism, but at the same time, it left a little bit of, <laughs> you know, it, it's that kind of writing where it leaves a little bit of sensitivity and feeling. And that really was the cascade effect. That's what got me into writing uh, mystery and crime and genre fiction. And that, of course, was just uh, later in life. That's just where it, it um, it really it took off for me. Which led to uh, the novel Stray Dogs? Stray Dogs was the first novel and I wrote. Became, which became the Oliver Stone film U2, <laughs> is that correct? It was, very, it was very weird to write your first novel and to have a house read it and really like it. And it was weird and it was strange. And it was all about timing. Oliver Stone reads it, makes this film that had, um, you know, had Jennifer Lopez, Nick Sean Nolte, Penn. Sean Penn, Claire Danes, Joaquin Phoenix, Billy, Billy Bob, Bob Thornton. Yeah. I mean, basically just this roster of individuals. And from that, that spelled in my, you know, my first script, my screenplay was, was the screenplay that became Three Kings, that was David O. Russell. So it was just, it was the right time, right place with that kind of vibe that I just you know, you trip into, you can work hard all your life, but sometimes it is about being the right time, right place, and around the right people. That's just the way it works. By the time Undercover Brother came out, it was, well, you're that kind of guy. You're sort of irreverent, ironic, funny. Yes, I was those things, but I also, I just like telling stories. And so in the novel space, there was an opportunity 
to tell these other kinds of stories. And so I did start writing the science fiction series, uh, Those Who Walk in Darkness right. and What Fire Cannot Burn. And I wrote a, uh, a story about a comedian in the 1950s, a black comedian in the 1950s called The Conversation with the Man. Right. And so it sort of took me in another direction. It was great, it was liberating, it was freeing, but in the film space, you were still sort of that guy. Yeah, I was gonna ask, were there people who were trying to keep you? You're that guy, you're the U-turn guy, or you're the Three Kings no. guy. I mean, the problem was the guy who was trying to keep me, that was me. You're in your late 20s, uh, you've written three films, people want you to write more films like that. I don't know if you've ever seen Rod Serling's The Velvet Alley. It's Set it, it is in the golden age of television, literally and figuratively. It was written in that time period right. by Rod Serling, who is, you know, people think of him as the Twilight Zone writer. You also have to think of him, wrote Seven Days in May, Planet of Patterns, the Apes, uh, Patterns, uh, for Heavyweight, The Man, which yeah. was about uh, the first black president in the 1960s, was amazing. He's just, you know, people think he's a great writer. He's not a great writer, he's a phenomenal writer. He had written a, a TV teleplay that was basically his life story. It was about a guy played by Art Carney in his middle age who could not get a break, could not get a break, could not get a break, and he sells a script to live television, and it's a huge hit. And he gets into the system, and a lot of it is about him in that system, but there's also an executive uh, played by Leslie Nielsen in a very dramatic role. You think of you know Leslie Nielsen now, um, an Naked airplane. Gun, yeah, an airplane, yeah. and he plays this executive who's always on the edge of being fired. And you know, 60 years later, nothing has changed. Right. But he has this amazing line. He talks about how you give up your freedom in creativity. He's talking to, to the writer, in, in, uh, played by Art Carney. They give you $1,000 a week, and they keep on giving you $1,000 a week until that's what you need to live on. And then after that, you live every day. You're afraid they'll take it away from you. And that's when they own you. At that point in my career, it's probably about 2005. And, you know, you're, you're still kind of young. You know, people are throwing checks at you. Just, you know, do another, you know, do, do another Undercover Brother. Do, do another Three right. Kings. Do something hipster, this and that. But the, those films were not exactly breaking through. So what do you do? Do you... You, you take that money and okay, you know, it's, it's the, the worst things in life. Or do you say, I don't, this isn't working for me. That was a great space when I was in my early 20s. You know, I'm getting to be my mid 30s. That's, it's just not me. Um, I'm not one of those guys who can sustain it and sustain it in an amazing way. So about 2007, I mean, look, everything changed for everybody in 2007. I mean, life shut down, the industry definitely shut down. You had a, Everybody was moving to the franchise model. It was Marvel, it was DC, it was those kinds of things. And you had a few men and women at the very top who were getting those jobs. And you had everybody else who was hustling for what remained of a living. It was, it was tough in every space, in every sector of the economy, obviously. And it was tough out there. And I really, and this was not me sitting and aggrandizing about me or what I thought I could do. It was just, look, I can chase these things with everybody else, and it's gonna to be tough, because you're not even on that list of people, um, if you're not writing some iteration of, of a hipster film, or you can start doing the things that you're really, really interested in. And I was very fortunate, because um, about that time, I'd, I'd been working with Spike Lee on some things, and I wrote a script about the LA riots. And it was, it was, it was I've always loved history, I've always loved things that were about something, you know, very different than those kind of hipster films, which were great and fun. Right. Something that, it, it revealed something about ourselves without being preachy, being in the moment, making people see and feel perspectives that weren't necessarily represented. And also about a time in history, particularly about the LA riots, people thought it was Rodney King and Reginald Denny. And we saw the video, and we saw the video, it was a black man being beaten, it was a white man getting retribution, and that was the story. And it was, it was so much more complex as these stories always are and wrote that script and has not been made to this day but it was the beginning of a real change for me and then two things really happened there was a story i'd been chasing for a long time that i was ex exceptionally passionate about that i thought was beautiful and unexpected and unknown about Jimi hendrix right and i just said i'm, I'm making this film i don't know how i'm making this film and the other thing was somebody presented uh, a memoir to me uh, it 
12 years. I just have to tell you, it was the most amazing book I'd ever read. And I really felt like I'd come full circle, you know, from not wanting to read to really reading something that changed my life. It was just beautiful. And with other people, I said, we are making this film. And we are going to tell this gentleman's story. It deserves to be told. I didn't know that the film would be that good, that Steve would put that much care in it, that Brad Pitt would put his life in it. Um, but you do get to a point where you're around people who just want to do something because they want to do it. Uh, and that's, you know, that's what changed over the last bunch of years. I know you had some hand in this plan. I'm going to get to the bottom of it. Pay him no mind. I paid good money for this. Courthouse got papers to prove it, and we got papers proving yeah, he's you. free. I own you. You belong to me. You hear me? Oh, I'm torn to shots across your back by sundown. So I think it's one thing to say the history, you know, much like Baskerville's in a way, obviously that was fiction, but it's about making things relevant. So it's not just old England, it's not just talking about swamps and bogs and things like that, but it's about feeling something in the moment, about curiosity, about fear, about um, being thrilled. And those are the things that are in history that excite us. You know, it, it, it's those moments. I mean, look, entertainment is, it's an empathy machine. You know, it, we're not here to just make pronouncements about things or to dictate. If, if that's what we're here to do, you know, the world would be even more advanced in terms of, you know, where we are, because there is so much cinema and TV and books and things like that. Yeah. You look at films like Lincoln, where it, the concept is we are going to show you Lincoln in two hours of the Emancipation Proclamation. That's pretty amazing. And right. it gives you ultimately more perspective than, you know, you got that much time in Springfield and you got right. that much time in Congress. The right. uh, same with 42, the, the Jackie Robinson biopic, you know, just his rookie season. And it really tells you so much more about the man, the struggle, the time period, the people who rallied around them, the people who stood against them, um, than sort of cherry picking through history. So I, I think in terms of presenting it, more than anything else, it really is taking the opportunity to dig more deeply. The expectations are higher. The capacity for people to call one out in terms of facts or perceived facts or what is added, what is removed, it's there. And I think it's driving those hysterical nor narratives in a way that has not been done before. But I think it's great. I think it's great for audiences because they are entertained, they are informed to a degree, but they also, it, it, it certainly, it's a film, it is never going to be true history. Of course, we'll probably never know what true history really is. Right. It's always written by someone or some group of individuals. But I do think those films now are closer to um, a, a level of, honesty or at least emotional honesty than they were even a short time ago. That's, I think in some ways it, it, it illustrates that sort of transformation of the biopic instead of, you know, it, it, is, it is something like a birth to death thing to something like My Week with Marilyn, you know? Yes, taking one week and looking at uh, her life and people around her and a, a real event, the making of that film, was very, very, uh, it was clever, it was bright. It was a really interesting way of doing things and something certainly we appropriated with All Is By My Side, where it was just one year in the life of Jimi Hendrix. It was not meant to try to just take slices of 27 years. Right. How much can we say about one year in the life of this individual? It's still crazy to me, like all these acts gonna be on stage. He's Simon and Garfunkel, Otis Redding, Janis Joplin, come and on, you? man. Like, yeah, <laughs> hey, can you believe that? Yes, I can. You want to go? Look, for these stories to be relevant, I think they've got to be informative. And if you're just telling people what they already know, what, what's the point? One of my professors told me, that has always stuck with me, said, if you're not reading with a highlighter in your hand, you're not reading. And when there is a subject matter or a book that I find that I love, and it's just, it is high lit, high lit, high lit, highlighted, whatever that is, dog-eared, uh, posted, noted it up, um, bent, uh, the binding is coming apart, I am scared to death if I lose it, I'll have to start all over again. When that book, I'm serious, and part of it, the reason I want to carry it around, I want to be afraid to lose it because it, that means that is, I'm working now. Right. I'm working and I have to keep this near me and I want to go back to that one thing. And I'm telling you, those among many source materials, but if you went and I have these books that I've worked from for um, 
uh, 12 years, uh, and obviously Solomon's memoir, but many of the Hendrix books and um, from the LA riots, and I keep them because it just, there's a pride. They are torn apart. I looked at those films and I kept thinking, well, you know, it's hard to go wrong when you have Solomon's memoir. You right. know, it, it's just, you're working from something that had so much feeling and so much emotion and so much drive. And I say it not in a self-effacing way, but truly, I think the, the headline would have been, you know, writer fucked that up, would have been the headline. <laughs> because you read it and it's there. It, it, it took work. I'm not, I'm not pretending that... You know, there wasn't work involved, but it was so potent and so powerful. And you look at what folks are doing across the aisle in the original category, and you go, man, somebody just sat and, and, and just mused and created and brought things together that didn't exist. And you think, well, that, you know, those guys over there are doing something. Like anything else, would you, would you do it because it's, it's who you are? Would you put those stories down? You know, Chris McQuarrie said something to me, and he's a phenomenal writer again, but a guy who just drops things that are incredibly sage. And he said about writing, it is a constant um, struggle to, um, because it is a personal thing, because whether you're literally calling people out in your family or whatever, or you're just drawing things from your life experience or things that you've heard or experience that you had, you're, you're always out there. You're, you're hurting people who you love to impress people that you'll never meet. You know, that's basically what writing is. You're taking wow. stories and situations that are very near and dear to you, and you're putting them out there hoping that, you know, somebody in Milwaukee, somebody in Boston, somebody in Miami will watch the show or read the book or pay money to see a movie and, you know, come out of it and say, oh, yeah, I'm, it was all right. You know, the third act yeah. kind of sucked, but it was all right. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, that's what that constant struggle is. You've been watching A Conversation with 12 Years a Slave screenwriter John Ridley. Next up, filmmaker Alex Clark and his short film, Siren. My name is Alex Clark, and I am the writer and director of the short film Siren. In Canada, when you, uh, to complete high school, you have to do 40 hours of community service, so I chose to do mine at a hospital. You know, it's not Grace Anatomy, it's not um, Scrubs, it's pretty boring and dull, and um, <laughs> so I would spend a lot of the nights when nothing was going on just writing my little notebook and, and making up these little scenarios and these little stories about the people that worked in it. Yeah, I really wanted to get a visceral, raw experience that the audience could share in, you know, and take them out of kind of daily life and give them this, you know, this heart-pounding thrill ride. Coming up is uh, my film Siren. Enjoy. It's my fault now, huh? Just wait a minute. No, just wait a minute. Oh, really? That's what the lawyer said? Okay, we'll put him on the phone then. Yeah, well, he's my son, too. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, well, you too. You right? Yeah. <clears throat> you sure? I'm fine. Because mm -hmm. you look like... This about that Jason dude? That guy's a man. All those cops are that you deal with. <laughs> really, man? You're giving me dating advice? X-ray 9, X-ray 9. X-ray 9, EMS 8713. Unconscious female, code 74737, East 82nd Street. Copy that. 
We're a code six en route. Your pay. Don't I always? Thanks, boss. Condition? Pregnant third trimester. Pressure is 130 over 90. Five minutes. ETA, five minutes to arrival. Copy that. 417 on route. Zero five inbound. It's 
still here, my baby. Mills? I'm begging him to hurt you. Please don't. Please don't. Please don't. Don't do this. Don't do this. No, Rachel! No! For more On Story, check out our free podcast at onstory.tv or search the iTunes store. And get the book today, On Story, Screenwriters and Their Craft, on Amazon.